I always think of that verse in Romans that says, uh, not only do the same, but also them that have pleasure in them that do them. Well, I don't do the bad things, or the revenge things, or whatever. <laughs> Anyhow, but I, sometimes you have pleasure watching that <laughs> in a story form. <laughs> okay. Uh, Acts 15, <laughs> we're following the, the events of the council in Jerusalem, where some had gone from Jerusalem to Antioch, and began to say to those Gentile churches that they had to be circumcised to be saved. And, and there was a big council in Jerusalem that Paul and Barnabas attended and shared the gospel that they preached among the Gentiles. And they've come to their conclusion. And what James suggested at the end is that they write a letter. What we studied last time is the beginning of the process of writing the letter. And verse 24, where we begin today, will be... Uh, what was written in the letter. But let, let me start for in verse 22, just to kind of remind us where, where we're reading. It says, Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and, and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles, oh, I guess here's where the letter begins. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised, and keep the, law, keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved, brother, uh, beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who, will, who shall tell, thee, tell, tell you the same things by mouth. For it pleased... For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay, no, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So that's the beginning of the process of the letter. We began, we, we studied down to verse 23 last time. Uh, looking at who wrote the letter and who the letter is addressed to, the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. And, uh, and as I look at the, those, all three of those areas are, are areas influenced by the Apostle Paul. Paul is ministering in Antioch, and that is in, in Syria, and Cilicia is where he had been until he was called over to Antioch, and we traced all that last time. Uh, just a little bit ahead of myself, we'll say more about this at the end of the chapter, but look at the last two verses of the chapter. It says, Paul chose Silas, now he's going to go on a second apostolic ministry, Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. And uh, it connects Syria and Cilicia, Paul's ministry, uh, if you read that uh, and connect that in verse 40, commended unto the grace of God, recommended unto the grace of God, then, then that's, uh, to me, an identifying fact of those churches. Now, the letter continues in verse 24, where we'll continue our study now. It says, For as much as we have heard that certain, went, certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls, and, and you, you remember all this, uh, the last part of that verse should be so ground in your mind. <laughs> We've spent so much time in chapter 15 that the, the issue, the controversy, is whether the Gentiles had to be circumcised and to keep the law. And, uh, and, and so in this letter, they're talking about those that went out from them who have taught, tried to tell the Gentiles that they needed to circumcise, be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. As the chapter began, circumcised in order to be saved. And then, then, then they thought about adding on to them keeping the law of Moses. And the end of that, that verse 24 says, To whom we gave no such commandment. So when it says the certain went out from us, it's not something that we could absolutely conclude. It was certainly something that 
I was interested in trying to figure out for a, uh, to make it a matter of fact, and I, I don't know that we can make it a matter of fact, although there was really, because the, the, the group of men that we're talking about, like in verse chapter 15, verse 1, they, they were just called certain men. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the matter of Moses, you cannot be saved. When we say certain men, we're try, there, there is some disagreement whether these were circumcision believers who left Jerusalem and are saying that, or are these false teachers in the sense that they're, they're not... Uh, Paul calls them in Galatians 2, false brethren. And we were d- debating whether false brethren are... They're not real brethren, or they're brethren with a false message. And, and I say that it, it's because of other, other times that we're talking about other subjects that I've heard people refer to these people and consider them as if they were true believers, and it changes the way you look at other things uh, that I thought, man, i got to iron that out. Because I, I, when I heard people talk about these certain men as believers... Uh, that was strange to my ears, and then I started asking around. There's several who believe that, and uh, and I never took them as believers at all, and it doesn't affect anything right here, and the very fact that you cannot, maybe you can't, uh, I'll show you other things today, but if you cannot nail it down exactly whether they're believers who are teaching a false message or false brethren, people who are not even saved people teaching a message, uh, the reason you won't need to necessarily nail that down is that happens both ways. It doesn't matter what these people are, what they taught was false. That's the whole conclusion of the matter. And, and we have, not only in, in Bible days, but in today, there are people who are not saved trying to pass on false doctrine to the body of Christ. In fact, our study on, on Sunday, uh, when I talked, read that verse in 1 Corinthians uh, 3 verse 17 where it says if any man destroy this temple him will God destroy there's no doubt in my mind that that verse is not talking about a believer not living right and because his body is the temple we're talking about a lost person trying to defile the believers and uh, that that's a that's a lost person in in that case Um, but that's true There, there are there are people with false doctrine who never got saved a doctrine of salvation by works, trying to tell people who believe in salvation by grace that they're wrong and, and push that on, on believers. But there's also people who are believers who get in air and push their doctrine on believers too. So it really doesn't matter what their situation is, uh, but it does sometimes when you're discussing certain topics. And, and uh, to me, I, I was surprised the first time I heard anybody thought these people were, were believers. Uh, but the closest that would come to is at verse 24 where we're studying because verse 1 just says certain men went out but here it says for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you they went out from us now whether that means well from us would have to be from that group there but that still doesn't identify <laughs> whether they're saved or not and certainly when you study the passage it's real clear that when they went out what they taught was wrong and, and we'll get into that but but one other thing when, when they went out it says they went out from us have troubled you and the way he describes troubled you it says with words subverting your souls well the, the to subvert your souls subvert has to do with a reversal uh, it, uh, certainly it's contrary doctrine uh, look at look with me just for the definition of the term subverting your souls that, that's that's a pretty strong word second timothy chapter 2 It says in verse 14, it says, Of these put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, to, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's, there's a warning there of, those that would teach something wrong that would subvert the hearers. And, uh, and then to, con- to, to set the thing right, 
Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, but shun profane and vain babblings. Now that's referring to the things that are going to subvert the hearers. Uh, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat at doth the canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, whom concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrew the faith of some. Overthrow the faith of some. Uh, so there's a subverting of the hearers, and he gives an example of these two men, and they overthrew the faith of some. Subvert is to overthrow someone's faith. And, uh, and they do it with these words, that words of no profit, vain words, false doctrines, and, and certainly that's what we're reading about over there is the people, those certain men, certainly had these type of words, whichever kind of men they are. <laughs> Come over to Titus. It's, this is an interesting passage. In light, I, I don't think you can actually tie Titus into uh, Acts chapter 15, but there is, it does seem to have some similarity here. Titus chapter 1, this is where Titus is on, left in the island of Crete to appoint elders because they got a, a job to do on this island. It says, uh, here, here's the elders, what they're going to have to deal with. Verse 10, it says, for there are many, uh, for there are, yeah, many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. <laughs> One of them himself, their own prophets, uh, prophets of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. <laughs> but anyhow, Paul talks about putting Titus on the island of Crete to shut the mouths of especially the circumcision who for profit, financial gain, are subverting whole houses. And uh, that's the ones who went out, there were certainly of the circumcision in, in the sense of at least they were Jews. Uh, again, whether we could say they were saved or lost, we maybe can't define that perfectly, but that, that's the group that James or the, the 12 apostles and the elders of, of Jerusalem are sending out to make real clear that those men went out, and when they went out that they weren't sent with that kind of authority. Um, Back to chapter 15 of Acts. It says in verse 25, It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So Judas and Silas, their responsibility, they're being sent with this letter, with Barnabas and Paul, uh, back to Antioch, and, and they're going to confirm that the men who went out from Jerusalem and taught the Gentiles that they had to be circumcised to be saved and keep the law of Moses, that they, those men are false. That's the job of Judas and Silas. The letter says so, and Judas and Silo, Silas, they're going to say the same by mouth. They're going to say this letter is accurate, it is authoritative, from, uh, in the, or it is, uh, confirmed. what is it? Confirmed. Not confirmed. It, it is actually from the apostles and elders certifying it. That's what I want. And, that, and, and so they, they can vouch for the letter and for the statement in the letter the whole point is that, that those who went out and said that, they're false. Not only are they false, but the last thing in verse 24, to whom we gave no such commandment. They, went, they didn't, the, the elders and the, especially the apostles at Jerusalem didn't send those men out. And what those men said is not true. And, and, and so the, uh, they gave no such commandment. So uh, they're there to verify that that is a false message, and that those men in no way represent the leadership in Jerusalem, elders or, or apostles there. Which also, uh, you know, just thinking about things, 
Paul and Barnabas in Galatians 2, they go there, and not only do the apostles and elders, not only did they not send them there, and now are they declaring that that message is false. Remember, they didn't know that message was false at the beginning. Remember verse uh, uh, 6, the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. But they now know it's false. And they never sent them out in the first place. But they're now declaring it's false. And the reason they can declare it's false is because Paul and Barnabas went there and declared unto them that gospel which Paul preached among the Gentiles. And they learned some things from the Apostle Paul concerning the gospel of the uncircumcision that verifies that, that they're now declaring that those Gentiles don't have to be circumcised or to keep the law of Moses. They now know that from the, the teaching and the, and the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and they now agree on those things. But that, that is a present thing there. So, so Judas, uh, Judas and Silas, they, they go along to explain those things as well. Uh, men have hazarded, we've talked about them before, they hazarded their lives. We don't know all the ministry that goes on. We know there's persecution in Jerusalem and that those men are chief men among the brethren, but they're also men who at one point in their life or in their ministry, their lives were in jeopardy, but they stood for the faith and now they're going to go and, and, and declare those things to the people back in, in uh, Antioch. Verse 28, it says, it it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye do well, fare ye well. So finishing that letter out, not only did they make the declaration they didn't send them in, they made the, the point that Judas and Silas will declare those things as a fact when they get there, and then... Then it says, it seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost. You know, there, it's, you look at the council when it began, and there had been much disputing, and yet uh, it, it says, uh, where, we just read that, where is that? Oh, verse 25. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. You can disagree and still be in one accord, can't you? Well, of course, they're one accord because they're all in agreement. I, I, don't, I guess maybe that's not a way, right way to say that. They're certainly, the, the conclusion of the matter, they're all in agreement at this point. And, uh, but anyhow, when you get down verse 28, it seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost. It's not just an agreement to them. It's not only the elders and the apostles all agree, but this is of the Holy Ghost. They're, these people, the, the declaration... Uh, is not just human wisdom. It's it's seemed good unto them and to whole, and to the Holy Ghost not only to respond this way but to say the things they're about to say. When it says seemed good, seemed is uh, the idea of uh, truly regarded as good. It's not like scratching your head saying, "Well, it seems good." I don't know, <laughs> but it means truly. This is this is this is. This is truly, this is right. And it's right not only by what we've looked at, but the whole, it's right to the Holy Ghost too. Uh, and so that, that they would send no, put no greater burden on them than the things necessary. Uh, it seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost, uh, to, uh, and to us, to, uh, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Now the no greater burden than these necessary things uh, it, it's not, it doesn't mean that they're, okay, we decided you don't have to keep the law, but we want to keep these laws. When it seemed good, it, it's appropriate, it's right, uh, that, that you, they don't put anything on them, then, then what is necessary in the sense needful, proper action in light of the fact of, of you know, your calling and your salvation. Needful in, in, the, say, in the sense of what we already saw over in verse 21 when James first requested this, it says, for, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. When we studied that section, and, and James actually said the same four things that they concluded that they should ask the Gentiles not to do, is uh, those four things are because those things would be offensive to the Jews. 
And because that's offensive to the Jews, necessary doesn't mean necessary because you're under the law, because that's exactly what they concluded, they're not under the law. But necessary in the fact that it's, it's good, it's proper action uh, that, that, that ought to be followed uh, for that very sake. Now, there is a, it's interesting, this whole incident, and especially this reason, that if there's Jews out there among the Gentiles, and you Gentiles, you're not under the law, we've, we declared that, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved, but you claim to believe in Jesus Christ, and if you engage in these things, it's going to be very offensive to the Jews, not just to the believing Jews, and that, I don't even think it's the believing Jews he has in mind, it's the lost Jews, that that can be very offensive. I show you that verse in 1 Corinthians, and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, because... There is a principle, when I read that, uh, the, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, no, 1 Corinthians 10, and Romans chapter 14 all come to my mind, and, and maybe you're not as familiar with these verses, but the, the meaning of what, when it says these necessary things, why is it necessary? Because of how offensive it can be. Not, not necessary in order to please God to be saved, not necessary because you're still under that part of the law, but necessary because there are things that you can do and you can use your liberty in a way that's going to become offensive to someone else and that's not okay. It's not good. And, and you have in 1 Corinthians, now this is not, um, this is not Gentiles out in their, their association or their uh, influence upon Jewish people, but in 1 Corinthians 8, there's a problem that's it's so prevalent, it kind of runs 1 Corinthians 6, or uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, and 10. It, it starts out this way. In chapter 8, it says, Now, as touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Now, that's, a, that's, a, that's almost a sarcastic statement that he's making there. Yeah, we all know, because we all don't know. It says, knowledge puffs up but charity edifies. And if a man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. So when he's talking about we all know, we could all argue about we know that an idol is nothing and, and argue that to the point of conceit without actually having any charity in our heart toward someone who is more ignorant than we are. Verse 3 says, but if any man love God, the same shall be known of him. Now, that is, if a man loves God, you won't see it in his puffed up knowledge. You'll see it in his action. Because if he loves God, he's going to be concerned about God's people. And, and the problem here is, verse 4, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that that which is done unto... Uh, and, and that there is no other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with, some with conscience of idols unto this hour eat as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, be, conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worst. Now, you know what he's going to deal with here is that you can eat meat, because you know an idol is nothing, but if that meat was offered in sacrifice, there's a guy looking at you eating that, thinking you're participating in that sacrifice, and, and he is, because of his weak conscience, is going to think it's okay to worship other gods. And, and you're going to destroy that man just because you have the liberty to eat. Now, that, that's where he's going to with that. I remember the first time, because see, I'm like the guy up there in verse 2, we all know, Knowledge puffs up, and, and when you have knowledge, you put down the guy who don't have the knowledge. I see myself in those verses of, I know something you don't know. Not you don't, but other people don't know. And i got to be careful how you deal with that, because verse 8 was eye-opening to me. It says, in that middle of that verse, For neither if we eat are we the better, 
Neither if we eat not are we the worse. I would have thought I was better than them. Because <laughs> I know I can eat it. That makes me smarter. I'm right. Because that's true, right? We can eat meat. Isn't that doctrinally right? The guy who thinks if you eat meat offered to idol that, that you're participating in that, boy, what a weakling he is spiritually. But I'm not better because I can eat and he's not worse because he doesn't eat. Or, yeah, because he doesn't eat. I thought I was. <laughs> Do you think that way? <laughs> Maybe you don't. But I saw myself. I looked at verse 8. I, I remember seeing myself there going, oh, wow, I thought I was. But we're not the better. It says, verse 9, it says, But take heed, lest at by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. If any man see that which is, uh, any man see thee which hath knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple. Now, I wasn't going to participate in that, which are not, uh, 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 shall not the conscience of him which is weak, being emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. He goes back to paganism. He says, but, but when ye sin so against the brethren, ye wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no meat while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now see, that's the same principle that James is talking about over there in Acts 15 concerning Gentiles eating meats because of the Jews that are out there, whether it's saved Jews or lost Jews. That's why, look over in chapter 10. You, you can go through this chapter. He does the same thing, and he's, he's talking about liberty, verse 24, 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no man... Seek his own, but every man the, another's wealth. And then he starts talking about eating meats that are sold in, in the marketplace and whether it's been offered to an idol and so forth. And then you get down to verse uh, 32. It says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, and, seek, and not, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. See, he's not puffed up with his knowledge. He's using his knowledge and his liberty in order to help other people. And, uh, and so there's a proper use of that. So it's the same principle that James is teaching over here concerning Gentiles who are now saved, who are not under the law, but they eat things that would be very offensive to the Jews. And they eat it in a way, we've explained what all those things are, that would be a very offensive to the Jews. And so when he says these necessary things, it's not necessary in order to keep the law to please God. It's necessary because that, it's necessary for appropriate action. It's necessary for those other people, not, not your sake. Uh, in fact, when I, when I talk about necessary, come over to, it's back in Titus again. Titus chapter 3. Is there anything necessary in the age of grace? We're under grace. We got liberty. <laughs> well, that, that, but that gets you saved. <laughs> no, what, what I mean, watch this. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities, to powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready unto every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawler, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men, for we ourselves were also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to mercy, uh, His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and newing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on, ab on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which believe in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men. Oops, wait a minute. I thought that was the verse I was looking for. Oh, <laughs> I got to go all the way to verse 14. <laughs> Jump to verse 14. We'll read too much. It says, and let your, yours also learn to maintain good works for necessity use, that they be not unfruitful. I thought that was going to be down that other verse. It's over in verse 14. So among, he gives all these instructions about us maintaining good works. 
and let us learn to maintain good works, oh, for necessity use, that we be not unfruitful? Necessary for what reason? To be fruitful. To have, for other people's sake. And, uh, and so, yeah, there, for necessity's sake. So th th that's Acts chapter 15. That's what James is communicating there. Not, certainly not putting him back under the law after he just concluded you're not under the law. Not James. All the elders. James suggested these things, and the letter is now being written by the elders and apostles to the Gentiles declaring those very same things. In fact, go back to Acts 15 and compare verse 20 and verse uh, 29. Now here's those, thing, those necessary things that, that the Gentiles need to abstain from. Verse 20 says that we write, James suggested we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now there's four things there. Verse 29, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. Same list? Yeah, <laughs> different order. I, thought, I, I saw that. You know, I wonder if in their meeting they said, yeah, James, I like your advice, but uh, when we write this letter, let's put the meeting, the, the things regarding meat and blood, put all that together, and the very last one, we put fornication. See, fornication was the second thing in verse 20. It's the last thing on the list in verse, 20, verse 29. So, you know, how, you know how when you write a letter, if more, one person's participating, you know, you kind of work things out a little bit better. But anyhow, it is the same four things. It's just interesting that that different order is there. Uh, and then, so after they write that, then it says in verse 29, From which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Now, you know that you, you shall do well. First of all, fare ye well is, we say, we don't say fare ye well anymore, we say farewell. And, and really, you know, like, just looking at what the meaning of farewell, you know, I, we all, I, naturally, you know, it's by, but why do we say farewell? And uh, it, the actual meaning of that is to hoping you well in your travels. It has to do with, you know, like your Godspeed in the sense that you're leaving, you're departing. And, you know, this is the conclusion of their letters. It, for, you know, at the end when it says, fare ye well, it's almost like, uh, we wish you, how do I say that? Hoping you well in your travels in Christ. Your journey in Christ. Because uh, it's going to be ongoing. They're, they're separated in place and, and, and all. But so he, they say, he says, farewell. Uh, I say that. First, just to go back, that the conclusion of that, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So when it says, ye shall do well, that to do well is to, uh, like, like in Matthew 25, where the Lord is going to evaluate the service when he comes back to the, 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 the Jews who were, had the ministry and the service, and he tells that faithful servant, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. And so when he says, ye shall do well, it has to do with, ye shall do well done, well done. Uh, it means to do good. Uh, in Mark chapter 14, it talks about giving to the poor is to do good. Well, that's, that, that's the idea of ye shall do well. I, I like this idea that carries with it in Ephesians chapter 6, a passage you're familiar with. I think about... Talk about Kay's mom being 93 years old. I wonder if, if this was true of her. Ephesians chapter 6. It says, uh, well, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. So when, when the, the idea of ye shall do well, well here is the idea that doing well, that it may be, or doing what's right, may be well with you. The idea is that, uh, uh, that by doing the outcome of, what, uh, of doing these things, the outcome or the result of doing these things is a good outcome. So 
kind of putting, just looking at those verses and putting, when he says, when he said to them to abstain from these things, ye shall do well, ye shall do good, ye shall do what's right, producing a favorable result. And we already kind of spoke about what that favorable result would be, uh, the, the testimony of the Gentile believers among the Jews that are all out or all scattered out among the Gentiles. So they, that's the conclusion of the letter. And then in verse 30, and actually from verse 30 to, 30 to 41 now, we finally come to the conclusion of Acts chapter 15 in, in this sense that it's actually the confirmation. They, they wrote this letter and they sent it by, by uh, uh, Judas and Silas. And, and when they go now, the, the work of confirmation is going to be done. So verses 30 through 41 is, it, I just call it confirmation. If you, it's been so long since we talked about the overview of Acts 14 or 15. Verses 1 through 6 is the controversy. Verses 7 through 21 was the council. Verses 22 through 29 was the conclusion. And verses 30 through 41 is the confirmation. Got them all with C's there. So anyhow, verses uh, 30 and 31 take you back to Antioch. That's where it's going to resume now. And then verses 32 through 34, it's going to be about the ministry of, of Judas and Silas. And verses 35 through 41 is Paul and Barnabas. So verse 30 says, So when they had dismissed, they came to Antioch, when they had, uh, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle which when they had read, they rejoiced for the, count, for the consolation. So when it says, and when they had dismissed, they came to Antioch. So now we're back in Antioch. We had started out where something certain went from Jerusalem to Antioch, and then Paul, this whole council took place in Jerusalem. The letter is written, and now they go back to Antioch. When it says they go back, you know, you got they about three different times in that verse. Uh, and when they had dismissed... They came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude. Well, among the groups of, of they that are there, certainly si Judas and Silas went back with them, right? And they went back, as it said, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So Barnabas and Paul went back. But look over chapter, the same chapter, 15, look at verse 2. It says, And when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas... And certain other of them should go to Jerusalem. So there were others from Antioch that were down there in the Jerusalem council that are now back in Antioch. So the they is Judas and Silas and Barnabas and Paul and, and the others who came from Antioch. One of those others, if Galatians chapter 2 verse 2 is the same event, is Titus. Remember, he came down to Jerusalem as a, as a test case of someone who didn't need to be circumcised to be saved. And, and so, but anyhow, all, when it says they, they all, that's the group that's back in Antioch. And so verse 30 says, and when they had uh, dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together. I looked at that, multitude together. Now, I believe Antioch's a grace church, you know. If so, not all grace churches have to be small. I thought all grace churches were little churches. <laughs> Here's a mega church. It's a grace mega church. <laughs> Anyhow, the surprise there is, is how large, I mean, to be able to talk about gathering the saints and call them a multitude. Anyhow, when, when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered unto them the epistle. So they delivered the epistle, and it says in verse 31, and when they had read, they rejoiced uh, for the consolation. So they went back, gathered the multitude together, and they delivered the epistle, and they read the epistle uh, to them. An epistle, I'll throw a Greek word at you. The Greek word for epistle is epistle. <laughs> Episo or something. It's, it, it's, it, the, that's where we get the word from. It's actually just a, a, an English rendering of the Greek word. Uh, it means uh, a written message. An epistle we know as a letter. We know that because that's what James said or what they set out to do back in verse 22. It pleased the apostles and elders and... Uh, wait a minute. Oh yeah, and the, verse 23. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and so forth. 
So when they delivered them the epistle, well, all you got to do is go back. What did they deliver? They delivered that letter that was written. Now, by the way, I, things jump out at me. It says that they, and when, uh, they delivered the epistle. But that verse 23 said they wrote letters, plural. I was wondering, is there more than one letter? I mean, this is an awful short letter. And I mean, from, verse, uh, from the middle of verse 23 to the end of verse 30, uh, 29 is the letter. Well, that doesn't take a lot of pages, I don't think. So I was looking at that, the plural, and I, I thought of a couple different things. The, it might be plural because there's a lot of letters. Whether letters means, you know, like different letters from different people, or does it just mean there's a, the words written down, they're plural in that sense? The other way, that that letter, that epistle, is representative of several people. It's from the elders, plural, and the apostles. So their signatures are somewhere on that. So that it would, it's more than just like a letter. And, and anyhow, I'm just noticing... The, the difference between letters and epistle. But anyhow, they delivered them to the, the epistle, which when they read, they rejoiced for the consolation. Now, so, the, so they get this letter, and, and when they do, they rejoice. Devotionally, looking at that, Paul's epistles, we always talk about the epistles of Paul, don't we? Are written, and they've been delivered to us. But we can only rejoice and, and receive consolation from those epistles in our heart when they're read. See, they delivered the epistle, and it says, and when they had read. You can have Paul's epistle sitting on your shelf, sitting at home in, in the pages of the Bible. God, Paul wrote it. God delivered to you. You have it. But it can't mean anything to you until it's read. And when these, this epistle was read, it, it caused, as that says in that verse, um, th they rejoiced for the consolation. Now, now consolation that they're talking about there is, um, is that it, it, there's comfort, there's peace. There is a little bit, there was a controversy. There was some turmoil. Some people were trying to subvert their faith. But it's all been ironed out in a way that now there's peace. So they're rejoicing uh, in, in this consolation. They're enjoying this peace in this agreement that Gentiles know the grace of God is true. <laughs> and the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised to be saved or keep the law of Moses. Um, I, I want to end with a verse. I, I, I'm hesitating. But, but let me end with this, because I, I saw time going. Come over to chapter 15 of, of Romans. And the reason I'm turning over here is the word consolation. Consolation is a resolve. That's why there's, there's a resolution to this matter. And so they're consoled by that. But it's a resolve of like-mindedness that all centers in God. It, it was right to them and the Holy Ghost. It says in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, it says, Now the God of, of patience and consolation grant unto you to be like-minded one toward another uh, according to Christ Jesus. Consolation comes from God. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant unto you to be like-minded. There, there needs to be a like-minded among the saints, but like-minded with God in order to receive the consolation. They had the mind of God in that conclusion that took place in that council meeting. The reason I turn here is not just that word consolation and show that it comes from God. You know what the context all the way from chapter 14 to this is? The same thing we read in Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 10. It's now in Romans chapter 14, whether about a weak brother who can't eat meat and a brother who thinks he can, and that's why you shouldn't judge, and we've gone over those words about judging. And, and, then, and then you have this teaching in this passage to do things out of faith and, and not to destroy another brother. And the conclusion of the whole matter, it says, now the God of patience 
That's what we need to have, and consolation. Grant unto you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. And it's that ministry one to another rather than that selfish motivation and, and having the, uh, the mind of Christ concerning not only the agreement of the doctrine, but the ministry to the saints. And it, it matches that passage that we're studying in First Corinthians or in, in Acts chapter 15. We'll finish that letter out and next week when we come back, or the, the confirmation out next week when we come back. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word that we study one thing, but it does have many different branches to teach us, not only the resolution that they needed, but sometimes the resolution that we need to have when we have some knowledge, but don't back it up with charity and concern for our brother and can actually destroy a brother with no love and just knowledge. Father, we thank you that we can study your scriptures and receive consolation to the fact that we know the truth of what your word is, and that is resolved. And we thank you for resolved doctrine in our life as well. And we thank you, Father, as well, that uh, not only has Paul's epistles been written and delivered to us, we can read it and rejoice with the, in that consolation. And so we thank you for opportunities to read at home or to study together as a group of gathered saints. We give our thanks to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.